Okay, uh, thank you. Now I think we are starting. Um, welcome to this uh, very first uh, webinar uh, within the framework of New Peace Centre for European Studies. Um, uh, this is a seminar series that we have had for some time, but this is the first time that we have it in format of, of webinar. Uh, um, and, and this seminar series is funded by Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. My name is Pani Ledikid. Uh, I am a research professor here at NUPI, uh, specializing in European uh, security, foreign and security policy. And the question we will discuss today uh, is whether Europe is in crisis or where, whether it's in, it is on the rise. Uh, for some time now, um, the dominant view, both in the media and in academic circles, um, seems to be that the multiple challenges that Europe has been and, and still is confronted with have shown um, that the EU is weak and fragmented and that it risks being outcompeted uh, and overrun by other global powers rather than becoming a global power itself. But is this necessarily true? What about EU as a regulatory, regulatory power? What about its uh, diplomatic role? And the fact that the EU is known to be built on and become stronger through serious crisis. Today, um, as global uh, politics has returned to traditional great uh, power rivalry, however, few are promoting these sides of uh, the EU as a global actor. But Andrew Moravšek, uh, who is professor and founding director of the European Union Programme and International Relations Colloquium at Princeton, and one of the most cited scholars in European studies, both for his theoretical and empirical contributions, has a different approach. In a recent article uh, in the news magazine Foreign Policy, with the optimistic title, Why Europe Wins, he explains very convincingly why Europe is the future. He argues, and I quote, um, uh, Europe's distinctive pragmatic use of civilian power may be too dull, slow moving and technocratic to attract attention. Yet in the end, it gets the job done more cost effectively than other uh, means employed by rival great powers. And we are very pleased to have Andrew with us here today from the US to explain this very interesting view in some detail. And to give a comment uh, to his presentation, uh, we have invited another well-known scholar and policy analyst, Francois Heisbourg. As most of you probably know, uh, Francois is a senior advisor for Europe at in the International Study for Strategic Studies in London and a special advisor uh, of the Paris-based Foundation of Strategic Studies. And he has also recently published a book uh, in French about great power relations with a title uh, that in English would be The Age of Predators, China, America, Russia and Us. And as I read you, Francois, you have a somewhat less optimistic view on Europe's um, capacity to play a global role uh, in this age of predators. But we will come back to that, that in your comment, I guess. Anyway, we look forward to listen to you both um, and to discuss this very fascinating topic. 
Uh, and while you speak, um, I will ask also the audience to, to use the Q&A function uh, on the screen to ask questions. Um, it is open now. Uh, and uh, I will also do my best in the discussion to uh, ask as many as possible of your, your questions, but we only have one hour, so um, uh, we will see how many. And I know there are close to 200 registered for this event, so it depends on... on so please make your, your questions short and concise. Um, so then I have the pleasure to give the floor to you first, uh, Andrew. The article you wrote in Foreign Policy was published in July. Um, and um, uh, a lot has happened since then. And one thing that has changed is that we have now a new wave of COVID uh, uh, cases in Europe. Um, so my initial question to you would be, do you still think that it's correct to say uh, that Europe has handled the COVID in a good way and that it shows Europe's resilience as you, you argue in your article in July? And, and secondly, as we are moving closer to the US uh, election, how do you think that the outcome of the US election will impact the role of the EU? And perhaps also, uh, what would you suggest the EU's response should be, uh, depending on uh, who will be uh, in the White House? So, Andrew, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I very much appreciate Penny being invited back to continue a conversation. I think we started almost exactly a year ago on better times when we could do it in Oslo. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'll, t I'll talk a little bit about the article and then uh, address uh, some of those uh, uh, questions. I don't want to get stuck on COVID. I started the article by talking about COVID, but really it's an article about foreign policy. And the, the essence of it is to challenge the conventional wisdom, which I think almost uniformly views Europe as weak, fragmented, ineffective, as you very aptly summarized. Uh, and all the article does for those people who, who haven't had a chance to see it is go through what I think most people would think are the four most important cases or challenges that Europe has faced in the last decade uh, and point out that judged against realistic expectations, Europe's really done uh, rather well in facing those challenges, as well as any great power in the world today might be expected to do. And those four challenges are, are Russian aggression in Ukraine, uh, migration, uh, Trump, uh, and um, uh, what's the fourth one? <laughs> um, uh, da, 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 da. And um, uh, populism within Europe. And so, um, and although the outcome of these four things is not optimal, um, not ideal, not what we might hope, uh, my argument is that Europe didn't fail. Europe is just faced with a world that's relatively difficult to deal with. And one of the most important things to do when you're judging the success or failure of a foreign policy um, is to set realistic expectations. So where Europe has fallen short, by and large, there were no cost-effective options for anybody to address the problem in question. Where it's succeeded, it's often succeeded where other uh, great powers wouldn't or couldn't, and it's done so because it possesses instruments that other powers don't possess. In particular, effective, deliverable, non-military power. Um, so we can go through the four cases, I'll do it briefly, but I'm actually more interested in why people misperceive Europe in this way. And so I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, uh, because I can go beyond what I wrote in the article and then address the questions going forward. So the, just let's take the four crises in order. First, Russia's aggression in Ukraine. So a, a simple story of, of Ukraine would be in part inspired by the European example and European offers of civilian cooperation. In 2014, you got a mini revolution in Ukraine. Um, which led the country to align itself with the West. And then the question, the strategic question facing the West was, what can we do to help Ukraine in this situation? Uh, and the answer to that was not military. 
no country, not the United States, not the Europeans, nobody thought that they could face down Russia militarily uh, in Ukraine. Um, so what was the response? The response was almost entirely civilian, massive, most importantly, not the sanctions, which is what people think of, but massive economic aid to Ukraine, which kept it stable, about 20 billion over five years. Um, the ability of Ukrainians to work in Europe and remit money back to Ukraine, which is much larger than the aid that Europe gives. The ability of Ukraine to sign a trade agreement with Europe uh, and diplomatic support for Ukraine. The result is that the West has essentially stabilized the Ukrainian situation. Again, not optimally, but 93% of Ukraine now belongs to the West. And if one's a, what's a tough thinking um, geopolitician like my friend Francois Weisbourg, um, one would say we reached into the country closest to Russia militarily, socially, economically, and historically and said, they're on our side now, now and for the foreseeable future. And almost all of that civilian assistance, plus the high cost of the sanctions on Russia, was paid by the Europeans. Europeans trade with Europe, Europeans have personal exchanges, sorry, trade with Ukraine, have personal exchanges with Ukraine. And the result is 90% of the costs of the Western response in Ukraine and Russia, the sanctions and all this aid was paid by the Europeans. So there's one example of something that's surprisingly successful. Same story with migration, that Europe faced a migration crisis, not of its own making in 2015, when well over a million people came across the Mediterranean uncontrolled. Um, and many people said, well, there's nothing to be done about this. It's modern globalization. No country can withstand these kinds of forces of people moving. In the last year, less than 100,000 people have crossed over the Mediterranean, and that number has been going down year over year. Less people have died in the Mediterranean as well. Why? Because the Europeans have pursued a tough-minded, um, partially national and partially European response of closing off possibilities of migrating to Europe. Uh, they've criminalized trafficking and movement. Um, they've uh, built walls and fences not entirely unlike those that Mr. Trump has built. Um, they've changed the way they patrol the Mediterranean. And most famously, they've done bargains with countries in the Middle East um, to house uh, migrants. Now, people criticize this policy. They say, first of all, that the policy is sleazy or immoral, um, which from a perfectionist standpoint, it is. Um, and they also point out that it wasn't entirely centralized, that much of it was done by national governments, which is also true. But the fact is, it's effective. And European leaders know that the only way to maintain domestic political stability in Europe is to do something about the migration problem, with the result that European concern, Europeans when polled, show less concern about migration today, and there is less support for far right-wing parties today uh, in Europe. Eventually, most countries in Europe would like to get into a situation where they can allow migrants in in a more controlled way, both asylum seekers and particularly economic migrants. But the only way to get there is to credibly control uncontrolled migration, something people said was impossible, but Europe has done. Third crisis, populism. Um, so many people think that the great crises facing Europe today are uh, internal, the rise of right-wing parties. And I'll be very brief here. I'll just make two points. The first is that the extreme right in Europe is remarkably weak. Uh, in about half the countries, there isn't any significant right-wing party at all. Um, in other countries, those parties need to go into coalition uh, with uh, other parties. They're generally excluded from that, as they are, for example, in France. Uh, and um, even where they go into power, um, so in Italy, uh, briefly in uh, Hungary, Poland, uh, they rarely get anything done. Um, Orban, for all his deplorable policies domestically, is internationally a relatively well-behaved person. That leaves only the case of Brexit. And Brexit is like the perfect storm, the unlikely event. Um, everything about Brexit was exceptional. 
um, an exceptionally Eurosceptic country, a weird set of domestic events which led to this uh, uh, Brexit vote at the only point in the last five years when Britain's actually, as a majority, supported pulling out of Europe, um, and a weird political system which um, supports this kind of behavior because it doesn't require a majority to run the country. So um, Brexit is not at the least bit typical of what's going on in Europe. In fact, most countries have reacted against it. There now isn't a single right-wing party in Europe of any significant size that favors pulling out of the EU. And that brings us finally to Trump. Um, so it's striking that for all the talk transatlantically um, between the United States and Europe and the few issues like Iran, where there really has been fundamental disagreement. In fact, things have changed remarkably little over the past four years. The United States has not left NATO. And that was pretty clear two weeks into the Trump administration when it was obvious that Congress, the Pentagon and everybody would oppose any such effort. And what's more, uh, the U.S. forces in NATO were largely stationed in Europe, not to defend Europe, but to support forward American operations elsewhere in the world, which whether or not you're an isolationist in America, nobody wants to forego uh, that um, capability that the United States currently has. The result is it's essentially in the United States a non-issue pulling out of NATO and would remain so even if Trump um, uh, was reelected. Similarly on trade, as compared to the 350 billion in tariffs uh, or in trade that was uh, uh, protected in the United States against China, the trade protect protection that Trump imposed on Europe um, totaled about 15 billion, and most of it was WTO sanctioned uh, uh, retaliation on things that had been debated for decades uh, in the transatlantic relationship. Europe can defend itself in trade. It's heavily cross-invested with the United States. Uh, it is uh, capable of imposing counter sanctions, uh, and it has deterred somebody like Trump, despite all the nasty things he says about Mercedes driving down the streets of New York, uh, from actually doing anything. So I'm not going to sugarcoat the fact that uh, there are disagreements about other things, that it would be nice to live in a world where the United States and Europe get along better. And I expect, as polls seem to show, that if Trump loses in a week, it will go back to that. Um, but I just want to point out that Europe was able to defend itself from this geopolitical problem in recent years. So let me end with two things. The first is, why do people so underestimate Europe? And I think there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, almost everybody does it. Um, people who support Europe, people who oppose Europe, journalists, policy analysts, uh, politicians. Um, and some of the reasons we've already discussed that they hold Europe to unrealistic or idealistic standards. Uh, but I think that there are subtler reasons too. One is that policy analysts tend to think of the world in issue specific terms. They say, here is the one issue I'm interested in, say, um, uh, putting pressure on Orban to reform his government. And here's what you can do about it. And it's a scandal that nothing has been done. But of course, Politicians don't think that way. They think about all issues interlinked. And they think, well, I could put pressure on Orban, but that comes at a cost of Orban's support for other things. And whereas the EU is somewhat more prone to this kind of pressure because it has often has unanimity voting, um, all political systems involve these kinds of trade-offs. And so you yeah, really have to ask yourself, um, yeah, it would be nice if one could put more pressure on Orban. On the other hand, you have to deal with the euro. You have to deal with a common policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. You have to deal with funding for the EU. And these things have to be taken as a whole. And I think people tend to overlook these real world political constraints that exist. Second point, which I do mention in the article, is that Europe is incredibly dull. It's a simply boring institution. When the United States goes into Iraq, it's an exciting thing, it's headlines and so on. When you increase economic aid to Ukraine, it doesn't make the 20th page of the New York Times. And every journalist knows that they therefore need to make uh, stories about Europe and the EU sensational. 
And the way to do that is to talk about the imminent collapse, imminent crisis, immediate failure of Europe, and they do that in spades. Finally, I think you have people, uh, uh, ironically, part of this Eurosceptic mafia, uh, who are Europe's best friends, the true believers in federalism. The thing about the true believers in federalism is they never see an issue that they don't want the Europeans to do more about. So the result is they're always criticizing Europe for its shortcomings because they would like to see it do more. And whereas I feel this is a laudable instinct, it does in the long term in the real world tend to undermine confidence in Europe in a way that I think is um, uh, questionable. Um, so that's that's basically the story expanded a bit in the article. Let me just talk about things going forward. Um, uh, I do think it's more likely than not that, that Biden will win the election. I think what you will, just as you saw things get less bad than they might have gotten or than rhetoric suggested they got under Trump, I think you'll see things somewhat less good when Biden comes in than the rhetoric might suggest. Because most of these things we're talking about, a, a roughly common US European position vis a vis Russia, um, migration, uh, internal problems with populism, and even fundamental disagreements over uh, various trade issues between the US and Europe don't change because a new administration comes in. And you end up with having to deal with the tough problems. What are the tough problems? There are things like how to regulate tech industry, how to deal with China, um, uh, w w various things that have a interesting domestic political resonance in the United States, including spending 2% of GDP on, on the military, which most European states are clearly not gonna do, um, or um, how to handle something uh, like pipelines uh, from Russia. So these issues remain and they'll be managed. Uh, and if I were the Europeans faced with a new administration, regardless of who wins, I would stress the kind of pragmatic, results-oriented, even power-oriented discourse that I've been speaking for the last 15 minutes. Americans are pragmatic people. They like to get things done. Um, and that is even true under the surface when somebody like Trump is running the country. And in that context, it's much better to approach the Americans and say, listen, this is what we can do on common issues. This is, a, here are our red lines and what we're not gonna do. And let's do a deal and get it done very pragmatically. I think there'll be considerable room for that when, Trump, when uh, Biden comes in, if he does. And even if Trump stays in office, um, unbalanced uh, individual as he is, it's worth remembering one thing historically, which is historically the second administration of a president has almost always been able to work far more closely with Europe than the first. Almost every president since Lyndon Johnson in the 60s has come into office saying we should pay more attention to Asia and less to Europe. And they've ended up working much more closely with the Europeans because in the end, the close relationship between the United States and Europe is a structural fact grounded in the interests and power of those uh, two regions of the world. And it doesn't change uh, administration to administration. I'm very pleased, let me say in conclusion, that Francois Eisborg is here to comment. We've known each other for exactly 32 years. I showed up as a graduate student at IISS when he was a, a dis disarmingly young director. Uh, and we used to have these meetings once a week where we would go around and discuss somebody's work. Mm -hmm. And I have rarely in a policy setting seen such incisive, intelligent criticism as Francois and others delivered at those meetings. So I'm very much looking forward to his comments. There could be nobody better. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Andrew, uh, for a very interesting presentation. And uh, we'll now look forward to uh, Francois to your comments. Um, uh, Andrew ended on on uh, uh, saying that Europe should continue uh, with its pragmatic approach. Um, and this is also, as I read French foreign policy, is very much uh, in line with what Macron has 
um, or his ideas about how Europe should play a role in the global war be more pragmatic. Um, as I've read the uh, Clement Bon's uh, uh, article in Politique étrangère, um, for me that is very much uh, so. It would, would be interesting to hear your views on that. The floor sure. is yours, Francois. Sure, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Andrew, for your for your very kind words. I I also have very fond feelings uh, for that uh, part of our, uh, of our of our lives. It was it was really stimulating and great fun. Uh, uh, I'm not going to use the word pragmatism, not because I disown it. Uh, obviously, it is better to be pragmatic, like the French are nowadays rather than to be ideological like uh, the British are today. Uh, uh, we've had a role reversal in terms of how to approach the world between Paris and London. London is where the ideologues are. Uh, Paris, like other EU capitals, is the place where the pragmatists are. The problem, of course, is that pragmatism has uh, narrow limits uh, when you are in a transformative situation. And let me spell that out. Uh, first of all, uh, Andrew, I can only compliment you on the timing of your piece because any EU foreign policy can only look good in the time of Trump. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is cutting the bar uh, mercifully low. Uh, uh, and we will see within, uh, uh, hopefully, by the morning of 4th of, of, 4th of November that uh, we are going to have to uh, uh, raise our own game in Europe when we will face adults again on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, that being said, uh, and I'll start with the criticism and then I'll get into a, uh, the convergence and the substantive parts. Uh, there is an element of hostage to fortune, uh, a big element of hostage to fortune in your piece. Uh, uh, COVID is not over. We've only been through season one of COVID. We are now entering into season three, uh, season two, sorry, and we don't know when season three uh, uh, will happen, and, and we don't know whether season three will be a happy end, or indeed an end at all, or whether it will be the continuation of misery. And I have no idea as to how the EU uh, will be able to cope uh, with. Uh, 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 the outcomes which reconfinement, which is now the new normal, uh, is, is going to be. I mean, uh, 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 France, Ireland, Wales have opened uh, the way to reconfinement, and I suspect uh, that many others will, because it's unfortunately ever since the Middle Ages uh, the best way that we have. Uh, to stop uh, a, a, a germ from moving around uh, uh, when you don't have an effective treatment and you don't have yet a, a vaccine. Uh, hostage to fortune on COVID, and I, I assume that you're going to rewrite page one of your piece, uh, uh, which makes the Europeans look successful in the face of COVID. No, we are in the, in the depths of failure. If you're looking for a success story, go to Taiwan, go to Australia, go to New Zealand, uh, uh, maybe to Norway, uh, but uh, don't look at the EU as, as a whole. Definitely not. Not any more than you would look at the United States. And hostage to fortune also uh, in your description of the situation in Ukraine. I agree with everything that you write about the, ro the positive role of the EU in the Ukrainian affair. Uh, uh, the, the no quarrel there. Uh, but to state that the Russians have pulled out, well, uh, sort of, uh, they can be there within two hours uh, to where they used to be. And I don't know what they will do. Uh, so if at, at the very best, Ukraine has been a successful holding operation, and we don't know how long we're going to have to hold it, nor whether uh, Russian calculations uh, may change negatively. Now, to the to the heart. Uh, first of all, I completely agree with what you say about the underestimation of the of the EU, but I put it slightly differently. 
what people have tended to underestimate is not the positive record of the EU. They have tended even more so to underestimate its survival instinct. And this for me is the lesson of the last 10 years. Uh, the EU made it through the Euro crisis. It made it through the migration crisis. It made it through the through Brexit. And it made it through phase one of COVID, only phase one, in terms of marshalling an effective aid package, which, by the way, the uh, so-called recovery plan did not have as its objective the stabilization of the euro. Uh, if, if only the euro would go down a bit, it would be very helpful. Uh, it 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 helped uh, it it helped maybe to avoid uh, a longer and deeper Corona depression uh, than the one we are current than the one that we are currently having. Uh, people on both sides of the water really underestimated the survival instinct, and I include myself among those people. I didn't think we would make it reasonably unscathed through the euro crisis. Uh, now we know that the EU is a tough old gut and the Russians, the Chinese and the Americans really have to now to take that into account. You, you, you mess with the EU at your own risk, as Erdogan may well discover in the coming days when he will realize, like Trump, that there is no French trade policy. There is only an EU uh, trade policy. And that when you start uh, getting into a trade war with the French, you get into a trade war with the EU. Not a good idea. Uh, so here, here I agree. On the four crises, very quickly, uh, uh, the migration crisis, here again, I basically agree with what you, with what you wrote, but there is a new twist to it. Uh, since the beginning of COVID, migration has stopped. Uh, the OECD uh, has just released a study indicating that legal immigration, legal, I stress legal, has dropped by close to 50% among all of the OECD countries. And this applies to the EU even more so than to some others. Uh, illegal migration, uh, People, people don't travel with cameras around anymore. And so you don't see the illegal migrants being stopped from entering into the European Union. Uh, except when the Turks uh, uh, put one of their government cameras to show how nasty the Greeks are in preventing uh, weaponized uh, refugees uh, from Syria from entering uh, Greece. Uh, uh, but that's not a success of the union, that really is a success of the virus. Uh, uh, on, Bre on Brexit, of course, uh, you, I, I agree with you. Problems uh, uh, with some of the, uh, uh, I, I don't have a quarrel with your definition of e the EU's assets. Its normative power is indeed immense. You don't use the expression, but that is, uh, uh, I think, a fair characterization of what you are saying. And indeed, it has great breadth of spectrum in terms of uh, the tools that it can marshal. Uh, small problem, the EU as a share of the world's GDP, as a share of the world's population, is shrinking. And it's shrinking faster than is the case for the US, and it is shrinking faster than it is in population terms for China. Uh, if the EU does not have some form of alliance with the US when it comes to the definition of standards, I suspect the EU will no longer be able to impose its will on uh, both the US and China. We managed to impose uh, uh, GDPR, uh, GRDP, sorry, on uh, American and by extension uh, Chinese tech firms. Uh, 
I don't think we'll be able to do so in the future when it comes to the spin-offs from quantum and the uh, spin-offs from artificial intelligence. We're too far from the game. Uh, and we are probably managing uh, to be effective on the 5G front, A, because we are in the game, as the folks from Ericsson and Nokia uh, can tell, uh, but also because on this one, there has been a, a great convergence between the US and the Europeans, aided and abetted by the arrogance and the cack handedness of Chinese wolf warrior diplomacy. The Chinese really have, 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 have done every, made every single mistake in the how to be a superpower, an effective superpower manual. Uh, but I don't think the future is going to look like the past in this field. We are going to have to choose tighter relations with the US or with China, but we're not going to be able to fight both similarly when it comes to defining norms. As for the breadth of spectrum, here again, that's my choice of words rather than, than yours. Well, there is a bit of a problem with uh, the use of force. Uh, the EU does not operate quickly. It is not a Clausewitzian body. And that leads me to open the brief parentheses about uh, uh, why the EU is underestimated. I agree with what you said. Uh, being boring is a big part of the picture. Uh, but also, the EU is such a strange uh, non Clausewitzian, non Bismarckian, non Metternichian, non Gaullist animal. Uh, that people have great trouble figuring it out. Uh, 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 that that helps. In some in some occasions, we we advanced uh, we advance uh, masked as it were uh, uh, in a very Hegelian manner. Uh, but the use of force is in practice not part of the toolbox of the EU toolbox. It's part of the toolbox of member states. And here's where things get very tricky. Uh, and notably because of what is happening on the US side. In 2013, the Americans basically signaled that they were no longer going to play a leadership role in the Eastern Mediterranean. That was under Obama. Trump has confirmed and extended that policy. And now that we are in the middle of an extremely complex, multi-dimensional mess extending from Libya to the Levant uh, with two EU members, Greece and uh, Cyprus, being directly threatened uh, by Turkey uh, a, and uh, with an America which has not gone AWOL, but an America which is essentially at the same level of engagement as the United Arab Emirates, uh, Egypt, Qatar or France in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the EU will eventually come up with an EU policy in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's also to answer the question which was posed earlier on uh, uh, as to whether the EU uh, will do something. I think it will, but it will, have, it will come up with a policy for two reasons. One is that the French decided to threaten the use of force early on, and that caught the Turks' attention, to put it mildly. It, in, uh, I assume that it forced the Turks to withdraw for a number of weeks their, uh, their drilling ship. Uh, and in the meantime, the French have started working with their EU partners. And uh, this is where we will see over the next few weeks, I suspect, the beginning of the EU policy. But this is all very jury rigged, disjointed, quite messy. Uh, uh, not a model of uh, aerodynamics uh, applied to foreign policy. Uh, that being said, and I will end. I will end on this. I'll end like I began, actually, and that is, we are in the middle of the worst health crisis uh, uh, in more than a century, and uh, there is simply. I have no idea, for example, on populism. In phase one of the pandemic, uh, 
populism lost very clearly. Why, why did they lose? Well, A, because they weren't particularly competent in the countries where they played a substantial role. This is true outside of, of the EU as it is within the EU. Think Bolsonaro, think Trump, think etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the other reason why the populists did not do well is that uh, the insufficiencies of the EU were not due to cack-handedness by the EU. The insufficiencies were due to the fact that the EU did not have enough power in health policy. And the Italians in particular, you know, uh, at, at one stage, um, uh, uh, the extreme right was complaining because Brussels wasn't moving quickly enough. You know, when the populists start saying the EU has to do more stuff and it has to do it more quickly, you know that you won uh, uh, an ideological and moral battle. But that was then. I don't know what the situation will be in three months' time. And I suspect it will be really terrible because we managed to go through phase one, uh, but phase two, uh, I don't know how our social, economic, and health systems are going to cope. This is, we, we are really in a deep mess. There we are. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for this great comment. I uh, will give the floor back to you, Andrea, but just uh, let me just um, uh, um, kind of add some of the questions that we have got from the audience so you can maybe uh, also answer them. The first is, is related to the US election um, and, and this also related to what I said in, in, in the introduction. Uh, what kind of implication with, will the US election have uh, for um, for the EU's ability to to conduct it, its role. I mean, if mm -hmm. uh, if uh, Trump wins um, and uh, and uh, he goes forward with kind of withdrawing US from the multilateral order, uh, how how does uh, does the EU's ability to trust the EU the US um, may affect uh, EU's foreign policy? So that was one question. The other one is on China. Um, uh, I mean, the EU and uh, it said that how can uh, and should the EU balance between the US and China? Uh, the US wants support from the EU in its competition with China, but the EU needs China in order to to deal uh, with the climate crisis and so on. So how to balance between uh, how can can the EU hedge between between these? Mm. Um, and there is a question related to how um, uh, the EU uh, relates to Hungary and Poland, uh, which moves in a in a in an undemocratic way. Um, how the EU should cope with that? Um, yeah, we can start with with that, and I give the floor back to you, Andrew. Okay, um, Francois, thanks a lot. These are really great comments, and and interestingly, we uh, we agree on 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 most things. Um, I think that if you <clears throat> If you're more optimistic going forward, since we can't predict the future, but if you're more optimistic going forward, at least longer term, you, 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 then at least for me, you're optimistic because you think the world's going in a certain direction. So let's take Ukraine as an example. I don't think the fact that the Russians decided not to deploy full-scale traditional military force, take, create a new Russia connected to Crimea, all the things Putin was talking about early in the war. I don't think that that outcome is a chance. Um, the last war between two great powers um, was in 1953. Um, great powers have been involved less in major uh, conflicts than before. And so I, I view the probability of Putin attacking, say, Poland as essentially zero. And the interesting lesson I take from Ukraine is, though he could easily in 2014 have taken half of Ukraine, he chose not to, and also chose to restrict the, the use of traditional Russian military force and use instead um, subversive, asymmetrical force. And the lesson I take from that is we live in a world where lots of people, even people like Putin, are surprisingly risk averse compared to the way you might have thought of countries as being in 1939 or, or 1914. And if we live in that world, then the kind of tools that Europe has, not just normative power, but more importantly, I think economic power, 
and international legal power become much more relatively uh, important. Now, that's not to discount the need for things like French threat of nuclear of military force in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, countries still squabble, even democracies, uh, over particularly things like oil rights and shipping and fishing. Um, and that will uh, continue. But I'm not convinced that you need a you know, great increase in European military force or a centralized EU policy to be able to achieve um, what is necessary. Indeed, I think every dollar spent on traditional military force, not speaking so much about cyber warfare and, and other things, is probably a, a dollar or euro that undermines European security rather than increasing it because it could better be spent on something else that would increase the security of Europeans. I talked earlier about the European election in response to the questioner. I think things change less um, than uh, people think, um, both if Trump wins and if Biden wins. I don't think Trump can double down on a strategy of disengagement from Europe, and I don't think that Biden will all of a sudden agree with everything that Europe wants to achieve in the world. You go back to a normal uh, in which negotiating with Iran will be on the, if, if Biden wins, negotiating uh, with Iran will be back on the table. Um, trade agreements will trundle on. And I think actually in the short term, the greatest opportunities may be to pursue some kind of common policy toward China, tricky though that is, um, and to pursue some common policy toward the tech companies, which are not so popular in the United States these days, um, even in some cases on the Republican side. And something needs to be done about this. We've gone through a great industrial revolution or whatever you want to call it, digital revolution. And that always creates great concentrated power. And everybody realizes something um, has to be done about that. Uh, I'll just talk about one other issue that was raised, which is Hungary and Poland. Um, you know, I have relatives in Hungary um, who are, by the way, Orban supporters, and, and we have such intense family fights that we can't talk anymore about politics. So it's not as if I'm a fan of Viktor Orban, but I think that in the broader scheme of things, tough though this might be to say, um, making sure that Orban doesn't pat himself in politically and, and coddle his cronies is not the most important problem facing the EU. Um, ultimately, it's a problem that Hungarians have to deal with themselves. Um, a little more European pressure might be useful, but, but as I mentioned in the talk, that kind of pressure comes with a trade-off against getting other things done within the EU for which you need the help of other countries. And tough though it might be to swallow this medicine, I really think that that's just not the geopolitical priority uh, that's most important at this point in time. And again, you could view that as a story about the weakness in, uh, in, in Europe, of Europe. I view it as a story about the realistic possibilities that all countries face in world politics today. Thank you. Do you want to comment, uh, Francois? No, sure, happy, happy to do so. Uh, your question about Trump and Biden, uh, it's an important question. If Trump is re-elected uh, with a renewed legitimacy, I think the reasonable ex expectation uh, for the Europeans will be that during his second term, he will remove the United States uh, from the integrated structures of NATO a bit like de Gaulle did with France in the mid-60s. Uh, he, he doesn't like the alliance, he hates alliances in general, and he would have the legitimacy uh, to, to do this, uh, and he would find, he would, he would seize on any excuse uh, to do so. Uh, that would be, that's one of the reasons why there has been uh, a fair amount of uh, semantic and political and organizational progress uh, in terms of uh, 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 notably French and German uh, 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 convergence uh, on, on defense affairs. Uh, Biden, Biden is very different. Well, first of all, Biden would obviously not withdraw, <laughs> withdraw uh, from NATO. Uh, and in terms of relations with China, uh, I assume that his administration's concerns about climate change uh, 
would actually be quite similar to those of the Europeans. Uh, and that, uh, uh, like Obama, uh, Biden uh, would seek to find an element of cooperation with China on climate change. So that would actually uh, make things a bit easier on that side. Conversely, there is one thing in the United States where there is a consensus, and that's the Washington consensus on China. China is the peer competitor, not to say the antagonist. Uh, and uh, the Americans will judge their relations, will tailor their relations with the Europeans to a large extent on what Washington will perceive as being European help or European undermining of America's relations with China. Uh, a, this will be the new trade-off within NATO. We will, we Americans will continue to help you deal with the Russian nuclear superpower, because Russia remains a nuclear superpower. That is something which the Europeans cannot challenge, uh, whatever one may say about the French or the British nuclear forces. Uh, they are not in the superpower category. And we will continue to help you, but we expect you to cooperate with us on China in, in, in ways and, in, 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 and according to processes and fora which remain to be determined. That will be, for me, one of the key issues, one of the key problems which we will have to resolve together. Uh, well, are we, would, will we be able, as Europeans, to operate with the Americans on this? I, I think I, it will be very difficult, but I think, I think it will work. Just quick, quick, quick remarks. Hungary and Poland, I, I agree with Andrew, and I, I will not develop any further because the, 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 I consider this to be exactly the right approach. Uh, on Ukraine, I was in Ukraine. I was in Moscow uh, uh, just after the annexation of Crimea, and just before uh, war broke out in uh, the e in the eastern Ukraine. Uh, one thing which the Russians had not expected, and uh, notably Putin's closest advisors, was that the Germans, and particularly Mrs. Merkel we're going to stand up against Russian aggression. Uh, they were expecting the Germans to be the soft underbelly of Europe, and that if you know, Germany did not, was not in favor of sanctions, well, nobody else would do sanctions either, except maybe uh, Britain at the time. Uh, that is what did not happen, and that is what has given us this holding operation uh, success. Uh, and of course, what we also know is that Russia has the GDP of Spain, has the defense budget, uh, the defense budget which is about one third the size of that of China. Uh, Russia cannot do attrition. Its risk taking is very carefully determined, and that is indeed what happened. Last point uh, on defense. Uh, uh, Andrew, you say in your piece that uh, defense spending has hardly increased in the European Union. Uh, in money terms, that is in, in euros, that is actually not true. That our defense expenditure has increased substantially every year since 2015. Uh, it hasn't reached 2% in Germany and in many other countries, but that's because GDP was actually increasing as well. Uh, but the, for example, Germany's defense spending uh, has grown even more than French defense spending. And of course, in, the, in what one would call a fun fact on, on, on Twitter, uh, this year, 2020, because our economies are all going through the floor, uh, a, at least 10 NATO countries will exceed the 2% of GDP goal right. five, five years ahead of schedule. Right. Uh, that's, that's not something to be proud about, I would, uh, I would add. And I, I agree with you that these uh, defense spending metrics are not actually of the essence. Uh, what is of the essence is the ability to tie the defense effort into the diplomatic and strategic effort. And this is what the EU does not yet know how to do. Thank you. Um...
Uh, do I have? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Francois. Um, I, I will uh, take in a few uh, more questions. I have one question here that is a bit, I uh, find a bit interesting is uh, um, from my colleague Christophe Fillon. Um, he says that uh, it seems that you have a different, um, uh, that you talk about two different things, that Andrew is, is talking about Europe while Francois is talking about the EU. Um, so he wonders, are you actually talking about different uh, different things? Uh, uh, this is also related to a question that I had myself because I was when I read your article, Andrew, in Foreign Policy, I I was thinking about how does this relate to your a theoretical perspective on European integration. And I know that you are focusing less on the EU institutions uh, than the European states. Uh, and when I read this, I, 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 I was thinking uh, if you have this argument, then you have also to, to, to give more emphasis to the role of the EU institutions because uh, they are, are, are kind of the actors in some of these areas that you are, are referring to. So I would like you both to, to comment on, on, on that first before we continue. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of argue it both ways. The most important thing to keep in mind, I think, is that we should never conflate um, what the EU does with what Europe does. Francois was really good on that in the Eastern Mediterranean, right? Who cares in the Eastern Mediterranean or Libya or anywhere else, whether all European countries show up or whether the European Union formally speaking legally is involved or not. What we care about is whether effective instruments are wielded to achieve an objective in a cost-effective manner. And so I'm utterly unsentimental about whether Europe does it or a bunch of countries do it. If you look at migration policy, most of the things that are effective, uh, with the exception of signing agreements with countries, and even that was negotiated ad hoc, um, were done by, by member governments, which is fine. Uh, there's no reason for the EU to deal with all that. And I think the fact that federalists and idealists about Europe tend to criticize Europe is connected with this. They focus on what the EU does and not what Europe is able to achieve. That being said, there are clearly areas in which European coordination is useful and in some cases necessary to achieve objectives. The most obvious one is any kind of coordinated trade policy, sanctions or something. You can't have countries defecting uh, from that. Uh, even the sanctions um, were at least negotiated within an EU realm. They have a kind of quasi-legal status within the, the EU, though it's not really enforced centrally. And, um, and that's important. Um, but So I think you need to differentiate issue by issue. And some of the things we've talked about going forward, um, so for example, a meaningful investment policy vis-a-vis -vis China, is something that obviously needs to be done collectively at the European level. And I'm a big fan of what the Europe can do. Regulatory power wielded throughout the world, trade policy vis-a-vis -vis the US, these are very powerful things. But a lot of, and they need to be centralized to be effective. But a lot of the other things can be done in a mixed way or even by individual member states, and that's fine. And I think perhaps in projecting their image abroad and explaining to other countries what they can do. Europeans would be well served to be more fluid about how they discuss European power. The interesting thing about Europe is the incredible level of consensus, despite the exceptions, on something like sanctions, which you just never would believe Europeans would really all get behind and revote unanimously every six months for five years. It's almost unthinkable. That's the real power in Europe is that they can find consensual positions on things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Francois? Yeah, I would uh, simply add to that, which, which makes, uh, 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 which I basically agree with. Uh, uh, but uh, in reading your piece, uh, I had the impression and, I, and it's a shit. I mean, and it's also something which I assume concerning my own remarks that we are talking about EU Europe uh, rather than about the non EU European countries. That is, Norway or Britain uh, or Switzerland uh, are, not, uh, uh, are, are, are not major pieces in your assessment of UK foreign uh, your policy. Uh, 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 although the, on, 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 on their own, each one of these countries may have an important role to play, and that is particularly true 
of the Brits. So no, no problem, no problem there. But what I would like to emphasize is that the degree of congruence between what is done within the EU institutions, whether the Council, Commission, or the Parliament, uh, and what is done by the member states in terms of foreign and security policy, that there is now, there has been over the last four years, uh, a degree of convergence which remains to be um, confirmed. Now, let me explain that. That convergence revolves around the notion that the priority for the EU as a whole, whether the member states acting uh, separately or the member states acting jointly along with the institutions, and that is that whatever else is at stake, the vital interests of an EU member state, of any EU member state, become, have become an essential determinant of the attitude of the other members and of the institutions. And let me explain that in practical terms. When, Bre when, when the Brits voted for Brexit, one thing they were expecting is that we were going to throw Ireland under the bus. Because after all, the bilateral relationship between the EU post-Brexit and the UK is, on the face of it, much more important than our relations with Ireland. No. 60 million people on one side, 4 million on the other, and, uh, you know, simply no contest. And the Brits found out over the following three years that not only were we not going to throw Ireland under the bus, but that, that we were all, all, to, all of the other members of the EU, 26 others, were treating Ireland's interests as if they were our own. That was new. That had never happened before. And this is also what informs the current dispensation in the Eastern Med, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, when the crisis really began to become hot two months ago, uh, the German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas made a, an unwise statement, let me put it that way, where he was saying essentially that the Greeks and the Turks had to get together and with the help of some mediation, uh, uh, patch up their differences. The French reaction was, wait a second, Greece is a member of the European Union. You are going to push the Greeks all alone there and the Cypriots as well? And you're going to treat them as if they were Turkey? You're going to use the same standards? Well, that's no longer the case. Uh, Greek interests and Cypriot interests are EU interests. Now that has a quid pro quo, which the Greeks and the, and the Cypriots may not yet have fully appreciated. That is, it gives us a lien on Greece and, and Cyprus as to what their, uh, as what we expect them to be their best behavior. But the starting point in crisis management has to be we're not going to let Greece and Cyprus down because they are us. They are us. This is, for me, the biggest change which has occurred in, uh, in EU uh, uh, foreign policy uh, 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 over, the last, over the last four years. Uh, if I push it to the decade, first thing we discovered is that the EU has an incredible survival instinct discovery for all of us, and secondly, that in the following years, that EU member states are now increasingly seen as sharing, having shared interests with the EU and therefore have to be dealt with as if their interests were those of the EU.
So when, when let's hope that Ireland repays the favor done to them on Brexit when it comes time to regulate the tech industry. That's the question. Uh, you know, you know, because the, the strength of that system yeah. is that one country can get support from everybody. The weakness is that one country can hold it up. Right. And that is something you always have to deal with in the EU. But I think going forward, that's going to be huge because there's a potential consensus to be had between the median European and the median American now on what to be done about tech, which is a lot of politically very difficult issues. Uh, you know, absolutely. taxation, regulation, privacy, this, that. And and the Irish, it'll be very interesting to see what they do. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, I'm more optimistic on this than I would have been five years ago, yeah. precisely because Ireland was not thrown under the bus. Yep. Could I, um, do I have the, do you hear me now? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, I would like to just add a, a question because as you said, to take up uh, of the point that you said now, uh, Francois, that actually the EU has become more united. I mean, it, in the, the Eastern Mediterranean, we see it. We also see it uh, um, in how they deal with the UK. We have seen it from for some time when it comes to Brexit. But, mm -hmm. but I wonder when it, uh, we have some questions here that I will I'll try to, to, to put into my, my argument here. Um, because uh, um, when it comes to migration, when it comes to Ukraine, that you mentioned, uh, Andrew, as a success, um, if you look at the EU policy, I mean, that depends on what your standpoint is. I think if you want the EU to be a normative power, I think uh, many uh, are disappointed with uh, how, what the EU has become in, in migration um, uh, or in Ukraine. That in the neighborhood policy, one has moved from the focus on uh, integration path to more, towards more stability, uh, kind of traditional foreign policy approach, uh, assisting the Ukraine, but still not this integration path. And when it comes to migration, uh, kind of looking the other way around uh, when it comes to human rights abuses and so on. And, and my question is simply that, is that a necessary move in, all, in order for the EU to be a more um, important power uh, in today's world? Uh, and if so, uh, wouldn't it mean that the EU is moving away from this uh, kind of slow, technocratic uh, civilian power and gradually more into a more traditional power? Um, so, you know, two thoughts about this. The first is welcome to the real world. I mean, if you want to influence other people who don't want to do what you want to do, be they individuals, be they criminal groups, be they states, you know, you're in that Machiavellian world of or Weberian world of doing things that that you wish you weren't doing. And if you don't like that, be isolationist. But um, it's 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 it, it, there is no cost effective way to restrain migration without um, uh, hurting some people. And there is no cost effective way to take all the migrants who would come to Europe. The last time the UN polled people, they estimated that 900 million people would like to migrate to the developed world and most of them would prefer Europe. That's not sustainable, right? So sooner or later, one is going to have to draw a line. And the real question is, can you do that in a humane way? So I think most Europeans would say something to the effect of once migration, migrants get to Europe or have a legal status, they have to be treated decently, um, which, for example, in the United States and, and occasionally in places like Greece has not been done. And I think most people find that scandalous. But that's a very different issue than does migration have to be uh, limited? And I don't see any way uh, around it. Um, uh, the taking this uh, tough minded position. So, you know, uh, that's the cost of, of, of influence. And I think that it's the, the second thing I would say, that, which is very important, is if you're on the left or are you are socially minded or, or cosmopolitan minded and you think, as I do, that this um, uh, ethically grades. Um, pushing around migrants and so on. You really have to think about it more broadly. Um, migration is without a doubt the greatest force pushing Europe in a direction of extreme right politics, um, unstable political systems, um, sets of beliefs that in many other respects 
undermine the things that we as idealists hold Europe to, to be an exemplar of. So there is a trade-off. Letting in migrants doesn't just um, uh, 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 um, you know, solve a practical problem on the ground. It leads, to, it, it contributes to the stability of European political systems. And if you look very closely at what European leaders said when they did these things, that's the position they took. It is simply not an option to destabilize European political systems in the name of this humanitarian effort. And that speaks to the point I made before, that the mistake people make often when they think about these issues is to think about them in isolation. What would be the best solution for migration? But once you start thinking about political sustainability, what happens in domestic politics, how much it costs, what happens when the next wave of migrants come, you start to think you need to think about it in a more restrained fashion. Everybody finds that morally even abhorrent, but it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I will give the floor to you, Francois. We just add the question about France. If you could say something sure. about, uh, we have a question here about uh, French-German um, relations. Uh, and when it comes to defense, you said earlier that France and Germany um, are more kind of in line when it comes to defense, but at the same time, an, uh, um, um, an opinion poll that was done uh, by the ECFER recently, uh, looking at, uh, or it was not, it was a, a poll of how, what is the the uh, the most important issues, foreign policy issues in France and in Germany, and then defense is of course the priority for France, uh, but for for Germany it is it is not among the five most important foreign policy issues. So so I just wonder, are they do, do we see this, uh, the, the, the two as a couple to drive European defense forward? Um, so I just, that is one question. Um, uh, yeah, and the, the last question uh, is about um, uh, this article by the, the French uh, Minister for European Affairs, uh, Clément Bon in Politique étrangère, which is interesting because he is focusing quite a lot on um, a European Union that should be more uh, flexible, uh, less um, open to different institutional formats. And as I read it, it's very much uh, um, uh, the European Intervention Initiative is very much an example of this uh, this kind of new new uh, uh, Europe. And then we come back to this uh, Europe versus the EU. For me, it seems that the, that the France now it's it's. Is more open to to whatever works works in a sense um, to make Europe effective. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll take the the questions in reverse order. Uh, uh, first, the Clément Beaune piece. Uh, uh, the English language version is uh, has been published by the Atlantic Council. Uh, so uh, if you want to go and read it, go and read it because it, it it's a very impressive uh, article for. For me, it's a, it's the first academically serious uh, a, a treatment of uh, uh, of what how, of how Europe should develop over the coming years. It's not simply a, a policy piece; it is also a policy piece, but it, but it is academically distinguished. I think he wrote it during the uh, during phase one confinement. It's a very long piece. I mean, it's a you know it's a a, uh, uh, you need half a day to read it. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, yes, a variety of formats, and that harkens immediately to the defense issue. The uh, United Kingdom and France are two very similar countries in terms of how they see the world in foreign policy and uh, defense policy. Our military arsenals are quite similar. Uh, our ambitions uh, are quite similar. And uh, if you want to be effective in the world, uh, whether if you're French or if you're British, it's usually worthwhile uh, to, to ask oneself the question, uh, how about working together on this one between France and Britain? Hence the European Intervention Initiative. Uh, uh, I'm very skeptical about the initiative's ability to fulfill its initial primary goal, which was about bringing strategic cultures closer to each other. Now, the strategic culture of France and the strategic culture of, Fran of Germany are not going to come together quickly or easily. Uh, they will remain different. Uh, but conversely, 
uh, the European Intervention Initiative should make it easier uh, to co-opt British and other non-EU countries into operations uh, or policies uh, 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 in which there is agreement between uh, between uh, uh, EU countries and non-EU countries. France and Germany. France and Germany. Uh, the, the, the historical experience of the two societies is not identical, and it cannot be made identical. It is what it is. Uh, 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 will Germany uh, think in terms of extending, uh, 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 of increasing the uh, defense forces in order to project uh, force uh, here and there in the world? The answer is no, they're not interested. And I, I understand where that comes from. And uh, uh, short of having a major war, uh, 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 that cannot be changed simply through policy statements or even organizational uh, rearrangements. But uh, France and Germany uh, can actually uh, speak together and agree together on what needs to be done in the European framework on defense. And this is what is happening. And I would add, that uh, somewhat paradoxically, it may be easier to get this done once the German Greens belong to a governing coalition, which is not the case today, uh, than is currently the case because the SPD, the German Social Democratic Party, is actually much more reticent on the use or the threat of the use of force, uh, for example, in the Sahel, uh, then is the case for the Greens. The Greens hate everything, anything that is new. And they don't like NATO. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the Greens have done a lot of homework and uh, they are, the French know them well. I mean, we, we've been cultivating them uh, quite deliberately. Uh, because uh, we figure out that there's uh, one chance part of a, of a coalition in the reasonably uh, near future. Uh, on migration, uh, <clears throat> for if you look at various plain vanilla democracies, you have two polar opposites. Uh, one is Australia, and the other was the German Willkommen Kultur in 2015. Australia is absolutely absolutely beastly. Whenever an immigrant tries to come in illegally, he is dumped into a really bad internment camp, which has been leased in a godforsaken island in Papua New Guinea, uh, where hundreds of miles away from uh, medical care, from uh, normal life, and another one in the uh, atoll, which is a few thousand miles away, called Nauru. Uh, uh, I assume that this is not something which the European Union will do, but I'm simply making the point that a real democracy, you know, Australia is pure vanilla democracy, one of the most democratic countries, if one looks at Freedom House uh, type indicators. And furthermore, this is something where the, where the Labour Party and the Liberal Party, as they're called, as it's called over there, yeah. are in basic agreement. They've been doing this for the last 15 years. And the polar opposite is the Willkommenkultur in Germany, which was very remarkable, very humane, beautifully conducted. I, I spent some time with the Bosch Stiftung uh, a, uh, uh, going to some of the places where this is the refugees were being temporarily settled in Germany in 2016. And I came convinced that the Germans would actually succeed with what they've done. 1.2 million people coming into Germany in the space of a year and a half. Real shock. It's a great thing. Uh, 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 it worked. Uh, Angela Merkel did not suffer from it in any major way. She had, she had a few problems, but nothing major. But there's also a very clear bottom line. They're not going to do it again. No. Uh, this strained the system to its limits. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mercifully, the uh, alternative for Deutschland was such a 
a reckless, incompetent bunch of uh, 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 mostly uh, East Germans uh, uh, with a brown tinge, uh, that it, 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 it has spent itself out as a, as a major political force, at least for the time being. Uh, but uh, uh, once again, real policy, real migration policy, is going to be much more like what we've seen over the last year. That is, Greeks will prevent migrants from coming in from Turkey. Uh, and we will all look in the other direction when the Greeks are doing this. And the I same. Have, I get some signs here that we have to end. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Already, my goodness. Yeah, we have a little bit over time, and and we uh, we uh, uh, thank you so much to both of you for very interesting uh, discussion. I think we could have continued for for, for a very long time, uh, lots of topics to discuss. Um, but this was very interesting. So thank you to all of you, to, and thank you all, also to the audience who have uh, have come in with a lot of questions. I haven't uh, been able to to uh, to uh, repeat all of them, but at least some. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next time in Oslo. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah.